Hello everybody. Today, Southern Four Wheel Drive's TechNet is spread across South Carolina and North Carolina. Eddie and I are here at the Gulch's off-road park, and Mike is up near Asheville, North Carolina. Mike will be doing a 360 walk around of a vehicle, and here at the Gulch's, Eddie and I will be discussing some basic features of an off-road vehicle. We'll use a Jeep JL and a JK to illustrate these features, but the basic concepts apply to many of the newer off-road overland vehicles, like Toyota and Land Rover. But first, Mike, tell us about this week's great weekly prizes and how to be eligible to win a set of five BFG KM3s or KO2 tires. Mike? Um, Mike Morrison with Morrison Outdoor Adventures here and Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. Hope you guys uh, are having an awesome week and uh, everyone is staying safe and enjoying some type of outdoor adventures. So we have an awesome show tonight. Um, our very own Al Sweeney and Eddie Schrader talking about hill descent control, which is kind of this mysterious computer stuff that goes on inside your vehicle. Um, and they're going to spread some light on that subject for us. Um, but uh, I'm here tonight. I'm going to share a little bit about a vehicle 360, kind of pre-trip checklist you should check. Um, when you go out on the trails. But uh, a little bit of information before we get started, right? So this week, again, a chance to be eligible to win five BFG KM3 tires or KO2 tires. Um, we will share that information during the live stream so that you know what to do to win those tires. Um, that's going to be, uh, means you got to watch the entire live stream to find out. Also, Last week's winner for the trail sack filled with some goodies, a Southern Pearl Drive Spiderweb Shade trail sack uh, with some goodies, has uh, winner Joe Simpson. You won that cool kit. So check that out. Get in touch with Al. He will get that shipped out to you. Um, also, I want to remind you guys, Still running the chance for you to become a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive by going to www.sfwda.org, become a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive, and get the chance to win a set of tires. You know you want to win a set of BFG tires. Who doesn't like free tires? And now that we've learned that tires are sexy, you got to have some nice ones on your vehicle. So become a member, get you an extra entry to become a uh, to be eligible to win those tires, five BFG tires. I'm working on getting five for my truck. Unfortunately, I can't win. Oh, I'll put the rule down on me. But you guys can. We will hold that drawing at Dixie Run, and uh, you do not have to be present to win. So super excited about that. Um, so big thanks. Make sure you go like Southern, uh, like BF Goodrich Facebook page if you haven't already. Leave my review and tell them thank you for supporting Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. All right, without getting too much more into it, I'm going to pass it back to Al and uh, Eddie, and they're going to share with us about hill descent control. All right, Al. Thank you, Mike. We're here today at the uh, Gulches to demonstrate the use of the downhill descent control in the Jeep JL. I'm sure that we've all been out on the trail at some point and have come across a hill and started down that hill. And when we feel like we're going a little too fast, we touch the brakes and the front wheels lock up on us and it may go sideways or it uh, may just turn around on us there on the side of the hill. So we're gonna demonstrate today how to use the downhill uh, descent control on the Jeep JL. Uh, when we want to use that, first thing we got to do is it has needs to be in four-wheel drive low. So we're going to put it into four-wheel drive low. Hey, Eddie. Hey. I'm going to go on down the hill and set up the camera. Yeah. And then after you talk about how to, how to get everything set up here, I'll do a video of you coming down the hill. Okay. Right. Sounds good. All right. I'll continue with this then for a while. Okay. So in order for this to work, we have to be in low four-wheel drive. So we go through the process of putting our vehicle into low four-wheel drive. Uh, then we go to the gear selector, shift selector. We pull down into drive. 
you can switch over into the manual mode. That's the section there that is marked with an M and you can see a plus and a minus on top and the bottom of it there. We're actually using that to select our speed that we want to go down the hill. Uh, this uh, is set up for such as 0. Uh, 0.6 miles per hour, uh, 1.2 miles per hour, and it goes up gradually uh, to the top speed is about five miles per hour down the hill. So we can select those and we can actually change those as we go down the hill, depending on, you know, if we want to go a little faster or a little slower down the hill. Uh, so once we, uh, we get that into that selected speed, we have pushed the uh, downhill speed control button on the console there near the radio controls, air conditioning controls. And uh, we've selected our speed. Now we're ready to go. So we're going to do... Hey, hey. Hello, Al. Yes. Yes, sir. I've got the camera set up. Come on down when you're ready. Okay, I'm on the way. Okay, so Al's waiting up the top of the hill with a camera, and we're going to drive up there, and uh, he's he's going to videotape us coming down the hill. Uh, the hill that we're going to be on is is not very slick or rough or whatever, but it does have some little small stones on the top of it, which can uh, cause us to slide if we if we slammed on the brakes or whatever. So it'll help demonstrate exactly what the hill. Uh, descent control is and what it what's function and stuff so come on for a ride up to the top of the hill with me Okay, um, all right, I'm uh, lined up at the top of the hill, ready to start on your go. Okay, give me a three seconds and I'm ready. I'm here and turn hill descent on, and I'm going to put the transmission in the, uh, the manual position, and I'm going to select a speed that I want to use to go down. Uh, I've selected the 1.2 miles per hour, so I'm going to release the brakes and let it do the work of controlling the traction as I go down the hill to maintain my speed. Uh, this thing actually will pulse the brakes uh, similar to the uh, anti-lock braking system. I think they work together and you can hear it Occasionally, it sounds like it's grinding or um, scrubbing or whatever. But now I have my foot off of the gas and off of the brake pedal, and I'm very comfortably going down the hill. And actually, I can change the speed up now. I'm going a little faster on 1.8, and it's still well under control. It's kind of a loose surface, so it's a little bit slide to it. And I think probably if I just put the brakes on full, it'll probably slide. Uh, but we're letting the uh, hill descent do the control of the brakes. So that worked pretty well. A couple of things I wanted to mention to you about the hill descent control uh, it can be overridden by either accelerating or by uh, touching the brake pedal and uh, you regain control of the vehicle. Um, also, the information for this I found in great detail on a manual that uh, we're going to put a, a link to on uh, Southern Four Wheel Drive's Facebook group page. Uh, so you can go to there to find that, or you can go to Jeep's website and uh, look that up. I downloaded a uh, manual, it's about 650 page manual 
uh, gives a lot of detail that they don't give in the smaller printed manuals that they put on there. So uh, we want to thank you for watching this demonstration. And oh, by the way, one of the things that we have, a couple of us have found uh, that can help you, especially when you're out in the driving across the rocks or whatever with obstacles in your way. Uh, one of the things that you can do is use the driver's seat height control. And it's a, a lever that's located on the left side of the uh, seat here. And you can either use it to lower yourself or you can pump the seat up. And one of the things that the pumping the seat up as high as possible gives you a higher uh, location so you can see objects that are closer to the front of you and get a better uh, view of what's around you than if you're in the cruising mode with the seat way down low like you're out on the interstate or something. So hopefully the one of those, those ideas will help you a little bit with understanding uh, some of the features of the Jeep JL. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn the control off now. I'll just press the button here on the uh, panel and that disables it and I'm ready to go again. So How do you adjust that seat height? We have a lever on the side here. Yeah. If, if you pull on up, it goes up. It's in the upmost position right now. But And if you push down, the seat actually goes down. It goes slightly to the rear, too, as it goes down. Uh, so you may need to adjust uh, the seat forward and backwards to compensate for that. But it's uh, really easy to use. Oh, so it looks like when you pump it, it raises it about a half inch per pump. Yeah, something like that. Up to yeah. two or three inches. Yeah. So you remember how we, in a motorhome, how we had put a bottle out front to tell where, where you could see best? Let's put the seat in the lower position. Let me go out there with a bottle. Okay. And you tell me, set it down. Then we'll raise the seat up, and I'll move the bottle in. That's, and that'll tell us, that'll show us how much better view we have. Sort okay. of illustrate we can what do that. talking about. Okay, so we're going to go to the bottom, as far down as we can go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'll so get you crawl in. And since I have the bottle, I'm going to walk out here with the camera and set it down. You'll have to tell me when I get about the right place. Okay. All right. Try it right there. Move it. Okay, I can see the bottle cap at that point. Okay. And you've got your seat all the way down, right? All the way down. Okay, raise the seat all the way up. Okay. Okay, I'm all the way up now. Okay, I'm gonna make a mark right here where the bottle is. And then I'll come in. Too far in? Too far? Yeah. How about right there? Too far, keep going. How about right there? Yeah, that's good. I can see about the same thing I saw earlier. That, that, that gained us about three feet closer. So okay, I guess good. That proves that it helps, right? That's right. And I think it also helps being able to see out the sides. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Okay, so let's give it back to Mike and let him do some more of his 360 walk around. What do you think? That sounds good to me. Take it away, Mikey. So, um, pretty interesting about the hill descent control. If you guys have questions about that, remember, post it in the comments and preface it with a Q. Um, it, that way we will answer them at the end. So for my portion, we're going to talk about a vehicle 360 and kind of go through that process of uh, seeing, you know, what's this pre-trip inspection that you should do before you go out. And we're actually going to do it 
as best as I can with um, our Dodge Ram. Let me pop the hood as we come out here. But this is uh, the truck that my wife and I wheel uh, as much as we can. Obviously, we don't uh, get to um, get it on some of the tighter and narrower trails, but nonetheless, even when we're towing our tr with our truck in our camper or our home, um, we still try to do this uh, vehicle 360. So that's what I'm going to walk you through. Now, because I'm kind of um, kind of like a squirrel, right? ADHD, I have to start at the ground and kind of work my way up. So I always start down with the tires first. So when I'm starting with the tires first, right? What I'm inspecting is the tire. What I'm looking for is, first off, air pressure, right? Do I have the right air pressure for what I'm about to do? Am I getting on the road? So am I running my road pressure? Am I towing something? So can I check my tow pressure? But also with the um, tires, I'm also checking dry rot and cracking for maybe possibly an older tire. And I'm going to inspect and check inside of the tread. Maybe I ran over a screw or a nail or something that punctured the tread. So I can look inside here and see if I have any issues inside of the, the tread. If I find something, it's a whole lot easier to fix it when I'm in the driveway at home than when I'm on the trail. And once I air those tires down and they start flexing, it could pop out a rock or a screw or something. And then I start losing air pressure. So after I've checked my tire, I move down to my wheel. What I'm checking here is, is for proper torque on my lug nuts. Um, we all know we drive off-road vehicles, our tires on, aren't always perfectly balanced. But any type of vibration right here could cause our lug nuts, if they're not properly torqued, to back off, right? So we want to make sure that they're torqued properly. It also gives me a chance to do a visual inspection in here of the wheel, okay? So checking the wheel. First off, if it's a new vehicle and I haven't spent a lot of time on it, identifying if I have alloy or steel wheels. Obviously, steel wheels, stronger wheel, more weight, worse fuel economy. An alloy wheel is lighter, less structural, but it has better fuel economy. Uh, so I can identify what type of wheels I have. Now, after I've gone through and I've inspected my wheel and I've checked the torque of my lug nuts, go ahead and make sure, number one thing people forget, is check and make sure you got your valve stem caps on your valve stem, right? Make sure that they're right here. If you guys can see mine right there, make sure it has a cap on it. Because if it doesn't, you're going to get in mud and dirt and it's going to get packed in there, especially if it's cold weather and it gets frozen in there. It's going to be an aggravating experience when you go to change the air pressure in your tire. So make sure you've got that valve stem cap in there. Next, so I finished with all four of my tires and wheels, but I'm not done because you gotta check that spare. I can't tell you how many times I've been guiding a trail ride or um, somebody's got a flat tire and we go to throw the spare on the truck and it doesn't have any air, or it's not aired to where it needs to be. Go ahead and air it up to whatever your normal highest PSI that you run is on the road. Um, that way you can always air it down easily. So make sure that that spare is good to go and you have everything you need to properly change that tire, including if you have some of the wheel locks, the spline tool um, or the special key wheel uh, for the lug nuts to remove the tires and get uh, your spare out. Because if you don't have that tool, you're not changing your tire off road and you're stuck. So make sure you have that. If you just bought a new vehicle and it has one, a lot of times they're in the glove box. So check there. If not, get with your dealer to get a replacement because you've got to have it. So after I've checked all five of my tires and wheels, then I'm going underneath the front of my truck. And what I'm looking for here is if um, I have the ability the night before, and I'm going to turn my camera around, but if I have the ability the night before, I'm going to park my truck on asphalt, concrete, or gravel. And what I'm looking for when I wake up first thing in the morning is any drips or leaks underneath the truck. Uh, it gives me a quick visual inspection to let me know if I have any leaks or anything underneath the truck, underneath here. And if I do, then I can quickly and easily find out what type of fluid it is. Is it engine oil, transmission fluid, coolant, whatever? It's easy for me to identify versus if I was just in dirt or mud or sand or something like that. So if you don't have that option, throw some cardboard under your truck just to double check and see if you have anything uh, dripping 
overnight. You can even do this if you're running multiple days on the trail to identify if you came up with any leaks. The next thing I'm doing when I look underneath my truck is I'm identifying the low hanging points underneath my vehicle. Um, now, obviously, if you've got a vehicle that you've been driving for a long time, you know this, right? But remember that this can change based on tire size, lifts, and stuff like that. You can see with my truck, I've got my differential in the front on the solid or live axle that's offset to the driver's side. So I'm going to correlate that with something inside the vehicle as that's my lowest hanging point in the front. Then the rear, I've got that big differential hanging down in the center. So I just want to identify any low hanging points that I could possibly get stuck. And I want to try to avoid those once I get off road, anything that's vulnerable. So once we finish up underneath the vehicle, but now we're going to underneath the hood. And this is the power plan of our vehicle. So I want to be super, uh, super in depth with what we check underneath the hood. And I'm going to turn my camera around again so you can kind of see and we can get some close up pictures. When we're, under, when we're underneath the hood of the vehicle, the very first thing we want to check is all of our fluids, right? So checking uh, transmission fluid, right? If we have an automatic transmission, some newer vehicles, you can't check it, but some you can. But with an automatic transmission, we want to check our transmission fluid. Make sure you read your owner's manual to identify how to check your automatic transmission fluid because not all vehicles are the same. Some they have to be hot, some they have to be cold. The next thing we're going to check is the engine oil right here, okay? Just to make sure that we haven't burned any oil, used any oil, or, you know, we can kind of tell um, with checking the engine oil what kind of condition it is and how dirty it may be. Next thing we're going to check is brake fluid. Now, this is where we start getting kind of important underneath the hood. Brake fluid and a lot of these other containers that we're going to look at, you'll see they're kind of clear or opaque colored, and we can see the line from the outside, and they're going to have a max and a min mark on the outside. That's because they don't want us to open these every chance we get, because most of these are sealed systems, right? Meaning that um, they're pressurized, or it's a sealed system to keep contaminants out. And every time that we open this, right, we're introducing contaminants into uh, that particular uh, system. So we want to keep it closed, and we can check from the side what our levels are. And if we need to add, then we go ahead and add. So the big thing with brake fluid too, to remember, is brake fluid is hydroscopic. So it will actually pull moisture out of the air. And a lot of people, me included, don't change out our brake fluid very often, right? Even though it's kind of recommended that you should change your brake fluid at least once a year, meaning that they completely drain your brake system and uh, refill it with new brake fluid to get all the trash and grime out. Most of us never do it to our vehicles. So you can imagine anything that gets into the system stays in the system. So next on the list, power steering fluid, right? Checking your power steering fluid to make sure that it's at the perfect level if it's applicable. I know some of you drive older vehicles and uh, they um, don't have power steering on them, but checking your fluid, right? Uh, with your power steering fluid. After power steering fluid, check your windshield washer fluid. A lot of people say, oh, well, that's not important, but a clean windshield will help you throughout the day. Super important to make sure that your um, windshield washer fluid is full. The last fluid that we'll check, um, and on my truck, it's actually a sealed system and hard to check, but I'll bring you around so you can kind of see. But engine coolant, right? Check in your engine coolant level. Same thing again, don't necessarily always open the container. You can see it's opaque and you can see from the side to check the level. Um, also, don't open up if you have a radiator, don't open up the radiator to check your fluid, make sure it's in there if it's hot. Uh, it could be very, very dangerous. The other tip I'll share with coolant is don't mix the colors, right? Don't mix the colors unless. It specifically says generic for all makes and models that you buy from somewhere like Advance or AutoZone. If you mix pink and purple or red and a different color, what happens is it actually starts to gel and 
turns almost to like clay in your coolant system and it will cause your coolant system to lock up and it's a super expensive repair um, for them to go in and clean that out if they can. All right, so the next thing we're checking is our battery. We're gonna check our battery connections to make sure they are clean and they're nice and tight, right? So for me, I've got two batteries here, one on this side and then one on this side. And why is this important, right? Well, when we're off road, we're typically driving at lower RPMs. So our alternator is not working at 100% uh, efficiency. So, so we may not be getting 100% of our alternator output back into our battery, but we're drawing a lot out. We could be winching or running our lights, our radio system, whatever so we're drawing a lot out of the batteries so we want to make sure these are good connections they're tightened down and they're clean free of any corrosion so that we're getting all of that power put back in to recharge your battery if not we could drain our battery while we're driving down the trail also make sure your battery is tied down right factory connections are best okay factory connections are best if you can do it but if you don't have that, you can get some type of aftermarket support to hold your battery in place. Bungee cords and ratchet straps don't cut it, guys. They don't. The reason it's so important is if you get into an off-camber or a even worse, a vehicle rollover condition, right? Now your battery's flopping around. It can come in contact with the hood and actually arc, and now we could create a fire hazard. So keep that in mind um, and make sure that your battery is tied down with minimum the factory um, or some type of aftermarket, not a ratchet strap or a bungee cord. Next up on the list, know where your major fuse block is underneath the hood. Most instances of failed vehicles uh, actually can be traced back to simple fuses. Um, so keep in mind, carry replacements for the types of fuses that you have on your vehicle, but know where to access this and make sure that your list that tells you what all these fuses does is still accessible. If not, try to find it and download it offline. All right, so also underneath the hood, some other things that I like to check, you can see down here our serpentine belt, right? Um, some of you older vehicles, you have the old style V belts, multiple V belts, um, but check this serpentine belt. Just like your tires, you're looking for dry rot or cracking down here. Now this serpentine belt runs everything. It runs your alternator, your power steering, um, everything on your vehicle. So it's one continuous belt. If it breaks, your vehicle's basically dead. So inspect it for dry rot or cracking or looking worn. Go ahead, buy a new one, replace it, carry this one as a spare if there's a little life left in it. It's a good thing to do. Um, the thing about serpentine belts is, is they take a crazy configuration to weave in and around take a picture of it with your phone or download a schematic off of the googly to uh, make sure that you understand how to reroute it in the field if you have to it's really a simple process um, but it's something that can ruin your day if it breaks all right last things underneath the hood that uh, we recommend checking in a vehicle 360 your air box okay go ahead and check your filter to make sure your filter is clean and good serviceable condition, especially if you're going to be going um, into a dusty condition, you know, like the gravel roads at URI. Tons of dust, man, you can clog up a uh, filter in no time. Pro tip, and I'm not even going to charge you guys for this, carry pantyhose because if you get into a dusty condition, you can actually take your box apart, wrap your air filter in pantyhose, drive, then when you're done, you can pull the pantyhose off and your uh, air filter is still going to be relatively clean. So uh, that's just a little pro tip to help you guys out. Also, super important to know where your vehicle draws air from, right? So that way we know um, where to watch out for ingesting water or moisture into the air box. And don't trust snorkels. Snorkels are not designed for water. That's a whole nother conversation for another day. All right, I'm going to turn the camera around again. So that is... Uh, underneath the hood. Once we're done underneath the hood, after that, we're moving on. Now we're gonna move a little bit higher on the vehicle and we're gonna just give a visual inspection um, of things like our gear. If we're going for multiple days or even if we're going out for a day, we all like to carry gear, right? So where is your recovery gear stored? When we look at our vehicle, the higher up that we store 
things like recovery gear or heavier items, the more likely we are to be top heavy. So storing all those items down low on the vehicle, right? But still has to be easily accessible. Don't take all your camping gear and pack it on top of your recovery gear. Then you get stuck and you've got to start digging through to get all that stuff out. So keep in mind about where you pack your gear, and that's important in your vehicle 360. For instance, uh, for myself, I have like these boxes here where I can store all my tools and things like that, but I'm still keeping all the heavier stuff down low. So I keep boxes in the bed of my truck uh, to store things in here um, so that it's easy for me to tie it down. And that's the last part of our vehicle 360. Once you are finally ready to hit the road, make sure, super important here, guys, make sure that it's tied down, right? Now, you guys that joined in for our rigging class and you learned about bow shackles and things like that, here's, an, here's a little bit of an example that I use. If you don't want to lay down on the ground and have me drop something on your head from about five feet, tie it down inside the vehicle. This is super important because if you are in an accident or a rollover, whether off-road or on-road, those things become flying projectiles. And uh, there are actually documented cases of simple things like cell phones causing concussion. And these are the old style flip cell phones that were super small, not today's smartphones. Um, so you can imagine a fire extinguisher or a bow shackle or even something big like a high lift jack that's not tied down flying around inside of our vehicle. Um, it's probably going to do more damage to you than the actual rollover would have done. So last part of our vehicle 360 is make sure that you tie all that stuff down and that it's secured. Um, the one thing I add to vehicle 360s it, and is, you know, inspect your recovery gear if you're going off road. Make sure that your winch works properly, things like that. Uh, make sure you have your winch controller with you. Um, I don't have a winch on this truck yet, so I can't necessarily show you kind of how I'd walk through that process. But just make sure it works. Bump it out, bump it in, then put the controller somewhere easily accessible inside the vehicle uh, so that you can get to it easily. But that's a vehicle 360. Do that before you even leave your house to go off-roading. That'll help you and save you a ton of time. Um, and it may help you find a repair before you get on the trail so you can enjoy the full day. Now, what I do also is after I'm done with my trail ride is I actually will do another vehicle 360 before I come home. It's not quite this in-depth, but I just want to check some of these things just to make sure that everything functions correctly before I get back on the road heading home. But if you guys have any questions, make sure you post it up. Al is going to talk to us about uh, some of the questions that were presented. But I'm going to hand it back over to Al now. Thanks, guys. Hey, Mark. Thank you a lot. That was good. Yeah. We, we, we had three questions. Um, Bill Simmerl asked, do you use Loctite on your wheel lug nuts? No, I do not. Proper, if you if you use proper torque, right? Find out what the torque settings are um, for your vehicle from the factory. If you're still running factory wheels, now if you change to a different type of wheel, you're going to have a different um, required torque setting. But if you prop, if you properly torque them, they'll never back off. But if you under torque them, obviously they're going to fall off. But what a lot of people don't know is if you over torque lug nuts you actually will stretch the threads on the wheel lug. Um, and over time, it'll get to the point to where you can't torque it down properly anymore and you'll start losing lug nuts going down the road. And once you lose one, they all start going after that. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next question comes from Tony Caps. He says, do you carry a steel cleanup kit? Yes, I do. Everywhere I go, um, even uh, if I'm not going off road, I carry a spill cleanup kit just because it's it's something small, easy to carry. I actually made my own, so it's not one of the super high tech ones. I carry just a small um, gallon Ziploc bag container of uh, kitty litter, um, or you know, quick dry from the shop, and a shovel and a couple of heavy duty contractor trash bags to be able to clean up anything that falls on the ground. Okay, good. Now now we have two pretty serious questions from Jay Bird. Uh -oh. all, some of you may know Jay. His first question is, 
do you include ice cream in the pre-check check? <laughs> if Jaybird's on the trail, have no fear because you don't even have to check in the vehicle 360. You know there is ice cream there. But it should be part of your vehicle 360. Get a fridge, get ice cream for the trail. All right. Hill descent is awesome. If you comment with that, you'll be entered to win the set of tires. Uh, that drawing will be the spot at Dixie Run, but you don't have to be present to win. So make that comment, y'all. Uh, and this week's prize had, a, had another phrase that you have to comment. Uh, trail safety is important. So comment. Yes, with it is. And Next week, Al's not going to be around. Not to be the host. And oh, it's, it's, it's all going downhill now. Unless uh, something fails, we're going to be talking about navigation on the trail. Mr. Jay Quatt from Florida Track will be our guest. Okay, let's take a night, man. Good night. Bye, y'all. Bye.